There is so much power in flowers, plant friends. We use their colorful blooms to brighten our countertops, signal a season, send condolences, or express love. A flower is so much more than a singular bloom. It is an expression and a connection to something deeper. Humans are just intrinsically hardwired to love them. Maybe it's because from an evolutionary standpoint, we see a flower and know that it might develop into something edible, or maybe that the sweet honey made by its pollinators are nearby. Whatever our known or unknown bias for blooms is, flowers are little joy bombs just waiting to be cut or grown and incorporated into major moments in our lives. It's undeniable that flowers can be a huge part of a wedding day, from the ceremonial bouquet and corsage and boutonniere to the ceremony and reception flowers and the design execution. They are used to enliven a wedding day and also express a part of yourself through your choices in what types of flowers, your color scheme, and so much more. When I got engaged, I knew that I wanted to incorporate houseplants into my wedding, but as a tropical foliage lover, I was actually tremendously out of my depth when it came to understanding just what went into wedding florals, or really just flowers in general. As the farthest I had gone with bouquets is buying a little bouquet of something local from my bodega or grocery store, I had no idea what a large floral kind of contract and incorporation would look like. Along those lines, as wedding florals are also a huge investment, I found myself going through a little bit of a wedding floral crash course on my own and with my florist, Karina, from The Botanist. With wedding planning in general, there's just so much that you have to learn so quickly because you've never planned a wedding before, and it's absolutely true for event florals as well. There is so much that you need to learn quickly in order to set yourselves up for success when planning the big day. And also as a plant person, there's so much to learn about the floral industry, about how flowers get sourced, the interesting different options that are available to us beyond traditional roses, maybe how to incorporate more greenery into our floral scheme, which is something you'll hear about in this conversation, and also incorporate the values of the plant parent in us that value sustainability, seasonality, and what's local. So Karina of The Botanist, the florist that I worked with for our wedding, is a very special plant lady who I connected with early on because of our shared belief in the higher power of plants and flowers. And we're so lucky today to be joined by Karina for a pretty epic conversation, a wedding flower crash course and flower power celebration. So welcome, plant friends, to the final installment of the Botanically Inspired Wedding Series on Bloom and Grow Radio. Here we are, plant friends, the final episode of the Botanically Inspired Wedding Series, aka the Planty Wedding Series. I hope you've enjoyed listening to the series as much as I enjoyed making it for you. To be honest with you, plant friends, it probably felt like the most personal thing I've done in my four years as a podcaster for Bloom and Grow Radio. It felt kind of like showing you a bit more of my personality and my personal life. And man, this wedding was just a huge part of the last two years of, of my life, and it was fun to kind of bundle it all up for you in this series relating to plants. I hope you've listened to both of the previous episodes before you embark on this one, and I hope at the end of the three, you walk away from the series with a fun idea to implement into your day-to-day -day life immediately, and that's not having to do with a wedding. Whether it's a new decor idea for your home, whether it's maybe a new technique that you learn in this episode around cut flowers, how to keep your cut flowers lasting longer, or maybe it is a fun design idea that you can hopefully incorporate to the larger parties that you will be hosting in your future, whether it's a wedding, a simple dinner party, or another life event. However you use these ideas and suggestions, please tag me on Instagram so I can reshare the way you incorporate these, these tips and tricks into your life with our community. I'm so thrilled to be joined by Karina, my wedding florist of The Botanist, for an in-depth look at all things wedding flowers today. We cover a lot, plant friends. This is a longer episode than normal because Karina and I just kept talking and talking about so many different things. That's why I'm calling it a crash course. But I hope that this episode provides you with larger insight into both the florist experience of prepping flowers for a big day, and also what we need to know as a to-be-wed. You're going to learn how flowers get sourced. You're going to learn how to keep cut flowers lasting longer. You're going to learn how to assemble a bouquet. You're going to get tons of insight into what we did for our bouquets and how to incorporate greenery into your wedding floral experience if you want to kind of rep your inner, you know, houseplant, tropical foliage, plant parent. 
I hope that you kick back, enjoy this longer episode, and enjoy Karina's very relaxing voice. And also, we have a special surprise for you. So Karina created a special tutorial just for us, a video tutorial. I'm going to be hosting it on the Bloom & Grow YouTube channel, and it's her showing us how to assemble a large bridal bouquet. It's really awesome. And after you listen to this episode, go check the video out because you're going to see a lot of the techniques that Karina talks about implemented in the way that she's assembling this very whimsical, very trendy bouquet. Um, in front of our eyes. It's really fun. So that's going to be linked in the show notes for you to check out after. And we've got a lot of fun video content going on around this wedding series as well. Okay, plan friends, enough chit chat for me. Let's dive right into my conversation with Karina. Karina, welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio. I'm so excited to have you on to talk all things wedding flowers today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, I'm so excited to have you. It's been two years since you and I first met on Zoom in the peak pandemic, trying to discuss planning my wedding. And you've been through every rescheduling of the wedding with my three wedding dates. So thanks for hanging in there with me. And thanks for seeing my, you know, not so traditional vision for my wedding flowers and elevating them beyond my wildest dreams. I appreciate you. Well, it's wonderful to have been asked at the beginning, and I'm glad that we got there in the end. Yeah, it's been a two-year journey with me and you and the botanist and this wedding. You know, I know I had a very specific kind of non-traditional vision for the wedding, or traditional with just a few little spins. And we met two years ago on Zoom in the middle of the pandemic, and you've been along for the ride with me, every rescheduling of a last-minute pivot from being indoors to outdoors and you turned the tent that we had to pivot to into a magical secret garden. So thank you. Uh, Oh, I'm very glad that you were happy in the end. And for what it's worth, you and everyone else also had to reschedule many times. So, I mean, the plight of a COVID ride. Yeah. It's been a strange time for everyone, but this year, at least lots of people have been able to have their wedding. And I have to say, I think to there was so much love and joy, I think extra on the actual day because people were just so excited for us that we finally made it. It was extremely special, but I'm so excited to be able to do a dedicated wedding flower episode on the podcast for this planty wedding series, because it was a lot for me to learn. You know, I feel like every bride kind of goes through like a wedding florals crash course (laughs) when you get engaged and get married. And then you say, oh my God, flowers are going to cost this much. And wait, I have to think about flowers for the card table and for the bar, like flowers go in so many different places in a wedding that you don't necessarily think of. And there are so many things that you all of a sudden have to make decisions and have opinions about that you didn't necessarily, you know, before you got engaged and, uh, and it's a huge expense and it's a big investment as well. Um, so people want to be educated when making that investment. I agree. It's interesting. A lot of times I'll meet with a bride who doesn't really know what she wants. And by the time we've had a conversation, then she starts to understand more what she wants. And I always say to her, for what it's worth, I know that we're planning things out fairly far in advance. And when we next check in, you'll be even more fluent in the language of wedding flowers and you'll have an even better idea of what you want. And it happens as well with couples, both of them get to know flowers and have opinions about things as they start to see more images and as they start to wrap their heads around how it's all going to sort of work out. And it's really interesting also because even people that don't think that they know anything about flowers, for the most part, they start to realize that this is actually what they like and this is the look that they're more into. And these days, more so than when I first was doing flowers, 10, 15 years ago, there's so many images that people are able to see and hone in on what they like in a completely different way, because that's a language in itself, just by finding images and showing it to us. And then we instantly know, ah, this is the direction you want to go in. So people don't have to know the names, but they know what they like because they can find what they like. So that's been a big shift. I feel like Pinterest is every bride's like best friend and worst enemy because you see everything and you want everything. And you're like, I want a chandelier filled with greenery and I want this and that and garlands and garlands of plants and all these things. And then all of a sudden you have to like have the conversation with your florist and be like, okay, what actually makes sense for us to do? Like, we're not doing the wedding for Pinterest. We're doing the wedding for us. Like, how does that translate? 
Yes, I get dizzy as well sometimes when I'm on Pinterest. I'm with you. Also, what's interesting about Pinterest is it will show images, but it doesn't really show how long something might hold up. So lots of things that don't necessarily hold up that well out of water can look great for a picture on Pinterest, but it doesn't mean that that's actually a sustainable situation. Or a lot of times people will show me things that are artificials, but they don't know that it's artificials. This was a huge mind-blowing thing for me in our conversations that I want to dive deeper into later because I learned I, almost every flower I initially thought of wanting in my bouquet. You were like, no, that's not going to work. But let's <laughs> let's hold off on there because before we dive in, we're going to have a really fun conversation about wedding florals and what to know about them and how to approach a florist and all that kind of stuff. Let's get to know you a little bit. So how did you become the plant lady that you are today and the founder of The Botanist? Well, I'm half British and in England, there's much more of a flower culture. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's pretty wild. You know, they have gardens year round. It's a little bit more overcast there. So I think that they have long history of bringing flowers indoors. And so in England, most people know how to do flowers the same way that here in America, we know how to sort of make a bed and we know how to you know, how to do, to cook. We know how to do certain things to do flowers in England is just sort of part of the repertoire. So I feel as though I grew up thinking that everybody was sort of a florist. So my mother and my aunts and my grandmother, they would always take flowers in from their garden. So there would always be fresh flowers. When you first walk in, there would always be flowers at weddings and funerals that my family would have done as well. So that to me, it's always been a part of just sort of something that I've loved. And also I particularly just really love plants and flowers. I feel so much better when they're around me. So, I mean, I'll take a vase into a hotel room for the night and have some greenery or something there just because I need something. So I think probably I've always also been drawn to a slightly, I, I mean, a more, I'm into tropical right now, but I think that just in general, I just, I would live in a greenhouse if I could. Mm -hmm. And I know that makes sense to you probably. And so, and it's interesting because now I feel as though that's much more of a sort of large thing that people are into plants and flowers. But 20 years ago, when I was really into it, it felt very much that, especially being in America, that there weren't that many people my age that were really into plants and flowers and that it was mostly something that people's mothers were into. So I thought I was a florist way before I really was a florist, for sure. And then once I graduated with a degree in communication, <laughs> I wouldn't say I totally applied that. Quite soon afterwards, when I was living in New York, I knew I wanted to be a florist and I did an internship with Bell Floor, which is a fairly well-known high-end florist. And they were amazing. Um, and they taught me a lot. They taught me how to make things look wild, but polished. So I think my style is probably wilder than their style, but they taught me very early on to take off every single dead leaf and just I mean, you're always influenced by whoever you work with. So you have to be careful who you work with because you really want to be stylistically exposed to tasteful things. And so after doing the internship with them, then I went to France for a few months and I was influenced by the flowers there. They have amazing flowers in Paris. Um, and when I came back shortly after that, I got my first contract in Rockefeller Center for the LA Sports Club. And it was a big, large contract from the beginning. So I was very lucky the way it happened. And yeah, I just sort of jumped in and began. And wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was, but you know, I think it's one of those things. It was sort of random. It was after some weird job interview and my best friends had come by and see me and she was working at the sports club and I met the events manager. They had dead bamboo in the restaurant. I said, you have dead bamboo. I'm a little concerned because I care. I care about mm -hmm. plants. I notice plants. And he said, well, we actually need a florist. And I said, oh, I could do it. And it was probably in hindsight, a bigger thing for me. The biggest thing was I didn't know how to create a proposal that really flustered me, but we got through that. And for, I would say 10 years, we used that same format of the proposal. And then when I was thinking, what name should I do my company? Because people were asking me for cards. I instantly thought I should do the botanist. And then we added an E for branding purposes, which also kind of gives it a little bit of a, a French shine. So yeah, that's awesome. From an educational standpoint, you kind of learned and cut your teeth by interning with other florists, exposing yourself to flowers and growing. It's not like you get a certificate in floristry or anything like that. I certainly could have. In England, lots of people do go to flower school. And when I was sort of out of university and saying, I want to be a florist, you know, I would say probably most of my aunts said, well, then you should go do a flower course. 
doing the internship with Bellflower was sort of, you know, that was how I trained up. I was taught how to condition flowers and I was taught how to make flowers. Then I was taught how to do various things. I was taken to the flower market. I was taken on site for events. I mean, that was, that to me was my, my, Mm -hmm. your training. Yeah, absolutely. And then when I jumped in to do my first contract, I mean, again, when I showed up to the flower market with this huge budget and I was putting together all these different, I mean, I was doing windows in Rockefeller Center right across the walkway from anthropology. I mean, it was a, a big jump in from the start of doing something. And again, I mean, I'm a little bit someone that usually puts the cart before the horse. So I think I had moxie and I really thought I could do it. And visually I knew what I wanted to do, but I really didn't even fully know the names of flowers when I first jumped in. So I'd be at the flower market and I'd say like, I want that. And I wouldn't know what it was called. And they thought that I was getting married at the flower market the first time I showed up because you don't usually show up with a big budget. They usually know you because you're usually working for a florist for years Mm -hmm. before you jump in. And after a month of me coming back and still buying a fair amount of flowers for the week, because I was doing this, you know, big thing in Rockefeller Center, they finally then started taking me seriously. And they were very amused that I had just shown up because again, now there's lots more florists that just jump in and call themselves florists. And they're sort of young and fun and they're not afraid to just jump in and start. But this was pre sort of Instagram. This was, this was when you still sort of started working in a shop and, establishing yourself before you dared actually go out on your own. And they still tease me about it when I go back there because they remember when I first showed up. So there was that. And then working in England, I worked for this amazing friend of mine, Sam Brown. She and I became friends um, and her company was Stigma. And it was just amazing working for her because she has such great taste and she had amazing contracts and clients. And so I also was really influenced by her style. So my biggest influences are both my family and the flowers I grew up on. And then probably a little bit New Orleans because it was so sort of, you know, wild and lush. And then Belfleur, which was amazing. And then also working for Sam in England. And then I sort of reestablished the botanist there. And then I opened my shop in Massachusetts. So that's been the trajectory. Yeah. A question I wanted to ask is what trends did you notice in 2021 Versus what are you seeing for 2022? Like, what are you seeing in the wedding industry right now? I would say there was a time when lots of different lush things and sort of, I I think it was almost a sort of British style of flowers was very, very in. And then I would say in the last, I don't think things happen one year to another. I think it's more of a sort of five-year period. Amalgamation. Yeah. I think that what's in right now very much is I think a big flower scene really kicked off more so than ever in the last 10 years in California. And I think that part of what's influencing California is it's very dry out there. So there's much more sort of tropical and dried elements because that sort of is what they need to work with because it's so dry. And that style has become, I think, the next thing up. So I think people are more into tropicals and also dried pieces. So big sort of pieces mixed in, almost a structural composition. Interestingly, I think that there's a feeling of anything goes. So there was a time when there was a very regimented way to go about doing things. But at this point, people can do whatever they want. So, you know, there's lots of, I think greens are in more now than they ever have been. And for a very long time, there was sort of eucalyptus runners and still now most people want a tablescape. So tablescaping has definitely become far more the thing than just having one vase of flowers on there. Although people still do that, but even if they have that, they usually have some branches and things down at the base. So I think that things have gotten a lot more wild, which I love. And when you say tablescape, what does that mean to someone who's never heard that word before? It could be a mixture of vases and greens sort of laid out, but it's sort of as green branches and lots of different kinds of leaves and greenery strewn sort of on the table in a way that both feels wild and celebratory and unusual because that's not usually what you have. And that seems to be more and more the trend of, of having, because, you know, if you think about it, most times if you're sitting down, that's not what you have happening. I think that, you know, and even just sort of big, I've, I've definitely had many more people contact me to ask me to make big installations in the back, similar to what you're sitting in front of, but of sort of greens mm-hmm. or even flowers mixed in. So sort of plant walls or flower walls, like that has definitely become a huger thing. And I think that that makes sense in the sense that these days, Instagram is such a huge influential platform that people like to have a backdrop where they can pose in front of. And so definitely this year more than ever. So I've been doing a satellite operation out in East Hampton, New York. So I was there this summer in the Hamptons and 
the biggest projects that we worked on. We did them for Ferragamo. We did lots of different projects. We did them for Todd's. People like to have one sort of really big piece that is just filled with flowers, whether it's a flower cart that was big this summer. Um, we did multiple ones for that or just a sort of huge backdrop of tons of different flowers and lots of different things. So almost making a, a fake flower kiosk, so to speak. So definitely, I think that, I mean, flowers and plants are having their moment. I think that's safe to say. If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent, each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. Totally. It's funny you mentioned this backdrop. So Katie, my wedding planner, made this green wall out of faux greenery. And we decided that instead of doing like a photo booth that like a photographer would run at our wedding, Katie just put together this epic green wall and she made the back of it with fake greenery. And then they ended up taking some of the flowers from the day, I guess some of the leftover stuff from the table and sticking it in the green wall. And it looked really fresh and wild and awesome. And it was just people took their own photos and Instagrammed their own photos with the green wall that said the Marcy's in front of it. That was actually a way for us to just reduce costs to not have a photo booth, but still have some sort of thing where people could take like a really memorable photo. You know, we're probably going to have a a mixture of people listening in today, budding florists who are interested in your business, and then probably new brides and grooms who are interested in wedding flowers. So let's chat wedding flowers first. And then maybe at the end, I can also ask you a couple of like business questions about like, where do you get, you know, how do you source flowers and like do that kind of stuff. But since we've already talked about wedding trends, let's stay in the wedding theme for now. How would you say wedding flowers differ from event flowers? Like, do you feel like there's a big difference? I think for event flowers, people just don't care as much. It doesn't mean the world to them. It's an event. They're planning for an event. They know what they want. We figure it out. We keep it moving. For wedding flowers, it's planned very far out in advance, especially in these weird moments because wedding seasons are almost a little bit more crunched in on top of each other since we slightly lost a year. So I think that, you know, we start planning in advance and And you know that things will evolve over time. But so even just committing to doing something a year out or two years out, that in itself, you know, you're holding the space, you're holding the weekend, you're having this meeting and you're sort of helping this couple to guide them about what they want. So wedding flowers are probably the most important flowers that a person can do in the sense that the only other flowers that maybe are as equally important but different would be someone's funeral flowers, but the person's not there to obsess over them. So though it means a lot to the family to celebrate that person, it's not the same. So I would say wedding flowers in that sense, there's an incredible amount of pressure at the same time because we care, we want to get it right. And we want the bride to be happy. So I often say, you know, I don't fully exhale until everything has gone off without any sort of, you know, that's what you always hope is that everything will be fine. And it's a lot of pressure but it's also a real honor to be asked to do someone's wedding flowers. And it's also a celebration of love. So in certain ways, it's also really heavenly because you get to see these people in love and they're figuring out what flowers they want to represent them. And so it's very personal and it's also always very unique. So it's not uniform. Every single wedding that we've ever done has been slightly different. So I think that that's partly what makes them different. And then even, you know, when you're doing a bridal bouquet, flowers come often in sets of 10. 
And even just out of that set of 10, we're going to choose the best flower out of those 10 to put into the bridal bouquet, especially well, the style that I'm very into is using all these different flowers. So we won't use that many from one specific sort of group. We'll use all these different ones, but it's the best one that comes from every single one. That That's what makes a bridal bouquet. And then there's also, we're planning things out and we're trying to order things in advance, but obviously with the chain of supply and everything that's happening right now, there's also you know, you always hope, well, if someone wants lilacs, that it's going to be a weekend where we're able to source those lilacs and that everything's going to be okay because there definitely have been lots of wholesalers that have shut down since the pandemic. And the, just in general, the whole chain of supply is just a tiny bit less secure. So I always encourage people very much to have a broad range of things that they are open to so that we can do the best that we can possibly do with the best ingredients that happen to be present that specific week. So there's that. Weather obviously also influences things, whether it's going to be outside or in. So as a florist, you have to be flexible right down to the very final moment. Um, And it's just, there's a lot of moving parts. So I think that those are the main things that make wedding flowers sort of their own unique brand. And also again, brides care in a different way. So for an event, we won't keep discussing it really that much, but for wedding flowers, We'll do a big meeting at the beginning. Then we'll do a check-in and we'll be continuing, you know, we'll, we'll continually have a conversation because brides mm-hmm. will see something that they like and they want to shift something or they want to add this. Then we do another check-in sort of a month and a half before so that we can just really confirm. Then we can place the order for what's coming. And, you know, even up to a week before there might be a, a last minute check-in about this shade is what showed up. Do you like this shade? This goes together. I know that you said you want this. Do you think that this is what works? And it's a balance because of course we also want the bride to feel calm and able to sort of enter gracefully into her final week. So we also don't want to sort of have to trouble her with questions that aren't that relevant. I put you guys through it because we 10 days before our wedding had to pivot from an indoor reception to an outdoor attended reception. And I was kind of bereft and my wedding planner was like, we can make the tent look magical. We've got to call the botanist and they'll figure it out. And, you know, it was interesting. It was a very nice tent that we ended up getting married and it had a floor. It had, you know, it was a sailcloth tent. It was beautiful. But the way that the florals elevated the space and made it truly feel like a magical secret garden instead of a white plastic tent that we're all stuck in. I don't think I had appreciation for wedding florals because I was like, I like house plants. Like I don't need flowers. You know, I remember even in my initial discussions with you thinking like, I didn't want any flowers in my bouquet. I just wanted a bouquet of ferns because ferns were a house plant and forest. And then my mother actually was like, Maria, you need flowers in your bouquet. And that was a uh, argument with her that I seceded, you know, I, I let her win I'm so thankful. They looked great with you. They matched you. They were perfect. And when they arrived that morning, it was, I felt like a bride holding a bride. There is a thing. That's what brides always say. Holding a bridal bouquet. That's big and cascading and had this beautiful long ribbon draping down. And also I had a kind of an eclectic bridesmaid palette and the flowers are actually really what pulled the whole palette of the bridesmaids together. And this color palette, that kind of burgundy mauve light pink kind of was carried throughout the entire wedding. Like the tone was really set with the flowers. And I feel like flowers can kind of make or break a wedding, you know, I would agree. And I, I, I wouldn't ever think of them as something that could break a wedding, but that's because I'm obsessive, but I'm with you. I think that, I mean, one prays that that's not what they would do. I think that that's the thing that's fascinating about flowers is that flowers, when they grace an occasion, they elevate it, no matter what it is, whether it's sad or whether it's happy or celebratory, just whatever it is, they bring comfort and joy in an unusual way. That's almost an alchemy. I mean, I really think that on a deep level. And so, yeah, for, I mean, when you think about it, wedding flowers, probably the way that it first happened was families would sort of harvest flowers and have it be to celebrate this couple. And now it's become a much bigger thing where you actually find someone that really knows what they're doing and knows how to do it and will take care of it for you and channel your vision Mm -hmm. for the day. But 100%, that's part of what makes something like a wedding so special is that there's all of these amazing flowers and greenery and plants and things imported in to make this sort of magical special thing. So I love that you felt like that because that completely is the whole point. You know, I think that people sometimes think that they're getting flowers just to sort of keep up, so to speak, but it's not that it really does make it feel special. And for us, 
we love when a bride, you know, almost cries when she sees her bouquet, because that's the whole thing that we're going for. We've been working for days obsessively trying to create something that you really love. That makes me happy. Oh, it makes me, I mean, I'm so happy and I'm getting them preserved with this really amazing flower preservationist. Who's going to turn my bridal bouquet into like bookends, like acrylic bookends and like a purse and some coasters. And so I'm so excited that the flowers get to live on forever preserved. What do you mean when you say a purse? She has this like amazing mold. She's this amazing artist and she turns, she dries the flowers and then she turns them into different, like thing. So you can get, like I said, like bookends or a ring holder, a ring dish, a tray. And she uses, I think it's acrylic. I don't really know what it is that she, it's like some sort of clear plaster that she sets the flowers in. It's so cool. I'll shoot you the link. Yeah. I'm so excited. So let's talk about, let's do just like a mini quick kind of crash course in wedding flowers for anyone who might be getting married, bride or groom, mother of the bride, father of the groom, whoever's planning the florals of the wedding. Something I wanted to talk to you that I thought was really interesting and was a big learning thing for me with a curve is not all flowers are wedding flowers. You can't just choose your favorite flower and have it in your bouquet because like you briefly alluded to, sometimes there are a lot of flowers that really don't hold up out of water and you can end up with a really droopy bouquet. And we had a long conversation about irises were my grandma's favorite flower. And I remember you saying, you know, we can put fake irises in a bouquet if you want, like we can kind of alternate it, but what are flowers to stay away from and what are flowers to kind of go towards? I mean, here's the thing. I do think that to a degree, you can have a lot of different flowers in your bouquet because it's true. It's going to be in the water. Then you're going to take it out. It's going to have its moment to shine. And then hopefully you'll put it back in water. So it keeps fresh for the rest of the evening. But I do think in general that there are some that are more delicate and less trustworthy. So what I normally try to suggest is I try to say, if you do want a specific flower, then let's have that in with other flowers so that it's not just doing the heavy lifting and we're depending on that flower to shine for that day if you can't completely trust it. And then there are times where I will suggest to use one artificial mixed in with your real flowers. Mm -hmm. Nobody will know the difference. No one's going to assume that's what's happening. It's nice because then afterwards you can have that artificial sort of in your home. Yeah. And so, for example, if people want poppies, so poppies are absolutely heavenly flowers. I love them, Mm. but they don't really hold up very well. And I think maybe the reason why they're called poppies is because they pop open so quickly. So you can get them from the flower market and you'll have them and they'll be closed. And then suddenly, almost as soon as they're exposed to sort of warm air out of the cooler, they pop open. But sometimes they pop open very quickly then they fade. And so I often will say, why don't we at least have some artificials on hand so that we can have some that we know are just going to be solid and looking all in their glory for that moment within the bridal bouquet. So, I mean, same with irises, I would say, you know, irises don't last as long as other flowers. So you could probably have an iris in there, a real one, but also always worth maybe having a backup iris that is an artificial one, just so that you can have that look um, without worrying and stressing if that Mm -hmm. will actually hold up for the day. You know, hydrangeas are also, I love using hydrangeas and bouquets, but I also wouldn't say just use hydrangeas just purely because my experience is one out of every five to one out of every nine hydrangea, no matter how well we've conditioned it, because conditioning the flowers is a huge part of it. You want to get flowers from good sources and you want to do a great job conditioning them. And that's what's going to make your flowers hold up well for the day. That's really important. But definitely, even then, occasionally a hydrangea will go down. So I always think it's just good to sort of use a mixed palette. So then that way you're not too dependent on one flower in particular. And then there's also times where things are just seasonal and it's hard to get. So for example, hyacinth, I love, but you can get hyacinth mostly in the spring. I was able to get it in September in the Hamptons, but I wasn't able to get it in Western Massachusetts. And yet here in Miami, that's where I am right now they have it. So, you know, there's different times where you can get it, but you can't always guarantee that you can get it. Some people absolutely love peonies or they love lilac. Again, those things often can be seasonal and it just is what it is. So when people say, I really, really want to have peonies, I mean, we often can do it, but there'll be times where we won't be able to. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing is that there are some flowers that just are more seasonal than others. I feel like peonies are a huge bridal flower. So if they're not available, what would you say are is like a good, hardier, kind of more available peony adjacent style of flower? Good question. I would say a garden rose. There's something about a garden rose that's just so heavenly, romantic, tasteful. It's 
always more expensive than a regular rose. And it's so interesting because you, it just brings so much to whatever it is. There's just a real elegance to it for whatever reason. And it's interesting because they also don't last as long. They're more delicate and they usually have, you know, I mean, they're definitely, they're their own breed. So I wouldn't suggest if you were trying to keep within a budget using solely garden roses, but to have some garden roses mixed in that creates that same sort of feel. I think the peonies do. I think you can also use artificial ones sometimes. Often you might be able to get some, but they just might be really expensive. So I might say have one or two and mix those in with other flowers, but don't have it be solely dependent on them. Unless it's that certain season, which is sort of between May, June, and July, depending on where, where they're you are. exploding on every block. Right. Yeah. Then they're in abundance. But that's the thing is that, you know, in Christmas, we can, we can get some because people like that for their sort of centerpieces. But again, they'll probably be more expensive and they won't be as easily accessible. So I think that's the main thing. I think variety is key because then you're not so dependent on any one thing. Mm-hmm. I think it's so much more interesting too. I mean, one of my funnest parts of my consult with you was when I was like showing you my bridal palette and you were like, oh, you need, gosh, I don't even remember what the name of the rose was, but it's like a mauve, like a cappuccino rose. You were like, that's, you were like, this is going to be in your bridal bouquet. And I was like, what? And you pulled it out of your shop and it's this like, it is, it's like mauve, it's like cappuccino mauve, almost a light purple Rose, I'd never seen it before, but it fit perfectly in this like kind of color scheme that I had. And it was so unique and interesting. It looked awesome. Well, it's interesting that you say that because that actually, that brings up another trend and I'm happy that that resonated for you. Definitely cappuccino roses, coffee roses, a rose called Earl Grey, a rose called Anemone Rose, which actually that's the one that's a bit purple and gray. That might be what you're referring to, or you might be the cappuccino rose, but all of those are this sort of new wave of roses. And it's almost a little daring because it's such an unusual Mm -hmm. hue and tone, but it really brings a sort of fresh energy to an arrangement because, you know, there really was a time, there was a time when everyone thought that baby's breath and red roses was just the thing. And still now people call us up and ask us for that, which very less and less happens, but occasionally like an old school gentleman will try to ask for that. We usually say we could do that if that's really what you want, but I really, I mean, we actually hardly ever carry baby's breath, but in general, if that's what someone's looking for, we say, let us try this and let's see about this. And we will make it right on the spot for the person if they're coming in trying to buy some flowers. And then by the time we're done, they're usually quite excited to bring it home to their person because it is a little different and chances are that that person will probably be excited by what's coming their way. But I do think that, yeah, there's a new wave of roses and of different colors. And that's been a really interesting addition for, I would say the last five years, that and um, pops of really dark colors seem to really be trending. That was in your bouquet. Yeah. So a dark purple scabiosa or a dark purple ranunculus. I think that's what I had, or I had a bergen. I think I had a burgundy ranunculus. Burgundy and dark purple are definitely cousins because they bring the same thing to the party of having that dark pop of color, which then makes everything else illuminated as well. That's one of my favorite signature moves. I think that a little pop of a dark color is really key. Or I shouldn't, I mean, it doesn't have to be, but. It made it more, I would say dramatic. I had a very kind of romantic would be like the theme of my wedding, but I thought it made it a little bit more dramatic and like, almost mo- like a little moody. And also we got married in the fall, which also I think that kind of worked very well. I'm curious about, you mentioned conditioning. So talk to me about what that means. Could you maybe walk us through the like life cycle of a flower from like when I guess you get it from whoever you're buying it from to like when it goes in the bouquet? There's one thing I wanted to just mention that you just said when you said it was a little bit moody, but also sort of autumnal. That's one other trend that I think is happening, which is there was a time when I think that people thought for autumnal that it, that meant red, orange, and yellow. And I feel as though things have really shifted now where it's much more sort of harvest colors. So shades of brown and maroon and mm-hmm. sort of whites and sort of that mixture of colors and that that is becoming more of an autumnal palette, even with sort of maybe blue and purple hydrangeas or just sort of dark purple. And so that actually is interesting because I feel your flowers reflected that as well of interpreting a different way to celebrate the time of year that you're getting married at and not going in the traditional route. Totally. And I think that that's something we've taken for granted as a shift in trends, but it really has happened. So when people call us up and ask for us to do autumnal flowers, we clarify to make sure what direction they want us to go in 
because it can mean very different things to very different people. Bright yellows versus like dusty kind of gray almost. Yeah. Yes. So I just wanted to, I thought of that when you said that because your flowers are modern in that sense, while also feeling old school and traditional, which is a, a unique spot to hit. So conditioning flowers. So yeah, that's an interesting thing. So whenever we hire on somebody, the first thing that we do is we teach them how to condition flowers. And so flowers have a much longer shelf life than I think people realize because flowers at this point, I mean, there's two different kinds. Of course, there's some that are local and we try as much as we can when it's in season to use things that are local. And in some ways they'll last longest because they're being cut straight from the source. Not always, but sometimes, but there's lots of flowers at this point that are being cut and harvested from Miami, from Ecuador, Holland, and even in Holland, those have come in from other places, possibly even from Asia. I mean, flowers are coming in from all over. And I don't want to act like I'm more of an expert than I am because some people probably know far more than I do. Um, So I'm just giving you a sort of brief introduction to the situation. But so then when we order the flowers, so they've already gone through auction, maybe in Holland or down in Miami, then they come in to our wholesalers. So whether it's wholesalers that we're working with in New York or Boston or Hartford, or our wholesaler in Western Massachusetts. We're literally down to like one. We used to have two main ones. Now there's only one. And they're wonderful. Springful Floral Supply. They do a great job. But so they already are getting the flowers in from a wholesaler who might already have gotten it in from an even a larger auction. And again, it's different for everywhere. Like in England, the trucks drive over from Holland. So, you know, there's all these different ways and channels. But so the biggest thing for flowers, what keeps them from opening up and from sort of continuing to evolve and I guess, you know, heading towards decay eventually is if they're kept in the cold and if they're kept in the dark. So that's a big way to sort of stop them from, from starting to sort of both come into their peak and then start to decline afterwards. So I don't think people realize that. And so when we're getting in flowers, most of the flowers will arrive into our wholesaler probably on Monday or Wednesday. And then when we get the flowers, we condition them and they've already been conditioned along the way. And that's why you want to get flowers from good sources. So they've been taken care of along the way. So for example, roses and hydrangeas, you want to cut the stems like this, and then you want to cut them up the stems and that allows them to have a lot more water. Cut it vertically. Okay. To cut it vertically. So if you're not doing that, then they're not getting nearly as much of a good drink. And so they won't last nearly as long. Hot tip. Oh, big. That's that <laughs> I've key. never done that with that hydrangeas. That is absolutely key. Yeah. You must do that with hydrangeas. And actually another thing with hydrangeas is they drink through their heads. So that's why hydrangeas often do really well in places where there's a lot of mist and can survive, for example, by the seaside and they thrive is because they're absorbing in all this water through their heads, even if they're not being watered all the time. So when we get hydrangeas in, we also dunk their heads in water for at least 10 minutes. Then we take them out, we shake them off so that they don't sort of get mold up there, cut the stems, put them in water. So those things will make a huge difference. Then we put them in a cooler and then they harden up even more. So what you want to do when you get a hydrangea head is you want to cut it horizontally and then you want to cut it vertically. So that will make a big difference because you're opening up the stem as much as possible. The real thing that brings flowers down is sucking in air through their stems. What they really want is water. And so they will create a seal on their stem to try to block out the air. But once they've created that seal, then they're not able to get as good of a drink. So that's why it's really important to cut a stem right before you put it into water. And if you cut it vertically for certain things that have a more woodsy stem, such as hydrangea and roses, it really allows more water to sort of be accessed. Today's episode is supported by Espoma Organic. Espoma Organic is a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. We know I love their liquid fertilizers. Their houseplant fertilizer is one of my favorites. We know I love their potting mixes. I've talked about my DIY potting mix that I make with their bag mixes previously. But did you know that they have an amazing seed starting mix? So we're in December. Tis the season to start planting our gardens already. I used their seed starting mix in Melody's garden last year. It worked great. And it's enhanced with mycotone, which is a proprietary blend of both endo and ecto mycorrhizae, which have been proven to promote root growth, increase water uptake, and reduce drought stress and transplant shock, which is super important for our little baby seedlings that we're starting. Set yourself and your seeds up for success by trying it out. And when it's time to pot your seedlings up after they've started, you can use all of the different Espoma varieties of potting mix, outdoor garden soils, and fertilizers. To learn more about all of the amazing products that they have to offer, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are. 
or click the link in the show notes to take you to my Espoma Amazon storefront with my curated favorite products of theirs. Okay, plant friends, if you're thinking about growing from seed this year, you've got to check out Territorial Seed Company. I had the best time growing from seed with them last year in Melody's Garden. I grew all sorts of different and super unique varieties of cherry tomatoes, tomatillos, vegetables, and lettuces. I loved growing from seed last year because I got to have more ownership of what I was growing in the garden because I got to hand select the varieties ahead of time from Territorial Seed Company's really amazing catalog instead of just showing up to the garden center and just praying that whatever I wanted is available. And we know that in the spring at garden centers, it's really hard to find exactly what you want. If you haven't already, I highly recommend trying to grow something from seed in your garden. It's a super exciting experience and it really takes your connection to the plants that you grow to the next level. It is so fun to watch a tiny seed turn into a 10 foot tomato plant. The other cool thing about Territorial Seed Company is they are their largest seed supplier, producing about 25% of their seeds on site at the 75-acre certified organic research farm that they have. And the trials that they do there are conducted under short season, high elevation, and low input conditions, which makes the varieties produced on site very hardy and productive crops. Plus, they don't use chemical fertilizers or pest controls. They source soil amendments from within their community, and they follow regenerative agricultural practices. They're awesome. Check their catalog and offerings out at TerritorialSeed.com and use code BLOOM10 at checkout for 10% off your order. Get growing now at TerritorialSeed.com and use code BLOOM10 at checkout for 10% off your order. Interesting. And then you put them in the refrigerator. So if I'm harvesting a hydrangea from my front yard, should I put it in my refrigerator first before I put it out? I mean, I very much would suggest it to let it, let it harden up and it will definitely last for days longer. Cool. So your conditioning is getting them in, cutting them, refrigerating them, waiting to take them out of the refrigerator. Now, what do you, do you use like flower food or any of those little like packets? I don't. I'm a little bit chemically sensitive because I've done flowers for so long. So at this point, I practically have to wear gloves every time I touch flowers or my hands will get sort of raw and almost a rash, which is rich for someone who's a florist. But nonetheless, you know, that's just what I do. I think that a lot of the things we work with have been chemically treated along the way. And that potentially might be what I'm allergic to. Most of the people that work at my shop don't have that experience, but oftentimes they might want to wear gloves when they're conditioning roses anyhow to protect their hands from the thorns. You can use chemicals for sure. I think good conditioning is enough and makes our flowers last. So people always are saying to us that our flowers lasted a shockingly long time and that they were really excited by that. And that's because we are diligent with good conditioning. Got it. So that's one aspect of conditioning. And then the style that I'm very into is I'm into curating greens and then stripping the flowers of their natural leaves. And that's because I don't find the leaves on flowers last that long. So for hydrangeas, we'll remove most of their leaves. For hypericum berries, we'll remove most of their leaves because they'll turn brown faster than the berry. For roses, we take off all of the leaves. And again, it's a subtle thing, but I think that that's partly why our style feels wild and lush, but polished as well. And that's because we've taken off all of those leaves and put them on top of this curated green base. So it's almost an optical illusion because they're being paired with greens that they aren't naturally supposed to be with. But in a weird way, that's kind of almost a smoke and mirrors move. And I think what makes things look so lush, but also so fresh. That's really interesting. I honestly didn't even notice in my bouquet that you did that because my bouquet was so chock full of greenery that it didn't, I didn't miss the flower leaves at all. So that's so interesting. Yeah. That's definitely a signature move of ours that we swear by. Oh, I love that. So any other like tips for someone who is just starting out planning their wedding and talking to florists, any other tips that you have before we move into the details of, of my wedding and what we did together? Do images. So if you have images, and you show them to florists, they can instantly tell the direction you're going in. So even if you have something and you say, I really like the size and the shape of this, even though this is not the color scheme that I'm into, that's great. Then we know what direction you want to go in. Or you can say, I don't love the way that this sort of is put together in terms of the structure, but this is the color scheme I really like. So that way, even if you can't 
totally speak the language of flowers just by showing us images, we instantly can grasp what direction you're going in. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then also I think a huge trend that makes a lot of sense to me that I respect and I'm into is repurposing things. So for example, if you have bridesmaids bouquets, well then have a use for them afterwards. We always deliver we the that. bridesmaids bouquets. Well, of course yeah. mm -hmm. you have them in vases and then you have certain designated spots where they'll go afterwards so that you are continuing to use your flowers to their fullest. Even times arches are huge these days. So we do a lot of arch decoration, but to have something that is able to then be taken off that arch by whoever is the sort of event coordinator on site for the day and put somewhere else for later on. I mean, things like that make a lot of sense and that really stretches your budget and uses it to its fullest. So that's one of the main things that I would say is very worth doing is knowing that the flowers don't have to feel like you just spent so much money for this quick ceremony and then that's it it shouldn't be like that you should definitely find repurposing places for them afterwards yeah our next episode in this series is a bunch of diy projects that you can do to kind of repurpose stuff in your wedding and uh one of the diy projects that i interviewed someone about was making your own copper trellis and doing your own kind of floral arrangement and then taking the arch or the arbor and moving it into your garden. 100%. I love that. Yeah. And repurposing it and then growing your morning glories on it or something, you know, I love that you said that because my mother has always had an arch before arches were big in England. I think that they've been big for a long time. And I 100% would support that because I think it's so special and exciting to have your arch that your trellis or whatever you want to call it that you've chosen. And then to have it afterwards at your house, it just makes it that much more meaningful. I love it. Now I didn't have an arch or an arbor at my wedding because we had a pretty epic backdrop for our ceremony, but any tips for someone going into that? Cause I would imagine that's probably a huge spend and a probably stressful thing. Cause it's like literally in every photo of your entire wedding. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing I would say is that's a good spot for your budget. I think that that makes a big difference is you want to have something really gorgeous there because that's probably going to be one of the main things that you will have for a photograph for forever and that you'll want to have because it's really that that's the moment. So I think that that's a good place to, to focus some attention to. Yeah. That's what my wedding planner said too, on the previous episode is don't skimp on your arch. And there's so many cool things now to do. I mean, I saw photos of one of our friends did a flower installation on a tree trunk. They got it married in front of a tree. And instead I just of did a tree trunk last weekend. That's so interesting that you say that. So gorgeous. But I love your tip to repurpose. Something that I learned is uh, just having gone through this whole process. And it was a practice at, in wedding planning. Hire people that you like, like and trust and then trust that they know what they're doing. Like I kind of brought my thoughts to you and then you elevated them far beyond what I could have ever thought about or dreamt because you knew that the cappuccino rose would be really cool. And you knew that the burgundy ranunculus would look really, would really elevate it. And I didn't, I don't know any flower names. I like tropical house plants. All I knew was I wanted ferns in my bouquet and I wanted some other stuff that we're going to talk about. But I would just say too, like, at first I wanted to DIY all my wedding flowers. I had this crazy idea that I was going to like grow them all. And that was insane of me. And I'm so happy we spent the money and partnered with you and, you know, worked with a florist and had you guys take control. Cause it's also extremely stressful the day of your wedding. I couldn't imagine having to do that. Well, so, all right. I'm so glad that you just said everything you just said, because actually all of the things that you just mentioned are so relevant in the sense that yes, like any chef or any artist, it feels wonderful if a client says, these are the things that I'm into, but I also trust you to now run with it rather than micromanaging. Because if people want something very specific, then we'll do our best to make it look good within the parameters they've given us. But sometimes it feels almost constraining and deep in our hearts and souls. We feel we could do a better job if we had a tiny bit more room to navigate and create. It's almost like if we have a lot of choreography and dance moves, but someone's saying, you can only do these three moves that I know. It's like, all right, we'll do them if that's truly what you want, but we could make it a lot more wild if you would let us. So in that sense, when people say, this is what I like and I trust you, there's an amazing feeling of this sort of co-creation that we're doing together of, we are just trying to channel your vision and then do the best that we can possibly do to 
deliver. And so to have that space with tools and a skill set that we don't have, and I only have a limited knowledge of plants. So I'm only going to be able to give you a limited scope of what I think I want. And I would just say, remain open in this part of your life and trust. I mean, I also planned a wedding in three different seasons. So obviously when you talk about seasonality, like the flowers we initially talked about, I don't really know what made it in and what didn't, but there was certainly a bit of a shift. So yeah. So just like roll with it, <laughs> roll with it. 100% roll with it. I do and pick think, good people, pick good people for sure. You want to like, and trust the people that you're working with. That's major. And we feel the same for our brides. For the most part, our brides feel so on brand and on the same page as us and that they sort of see and have the same kind of vision. And there's a real sort of camaraderie. And that's been a really heavenly experience. I don't really like the term a nightmare bride because to be honest, that's not my experience. It's just not. There's some people that care a lot, but that's okay. And there's some people who are obsessive, but I'm obsessive. And I think that that's part of what makes a a strong (laughs) florist and a strong production. So yeah, I would definitely say one of those things of, of, of be open and, and sort of give the florist some space because that will allow them to do their best for you. I would say keep things slightly seasonal so you don't have to lean too hard into it. But I do think there's a feeling of whatever season it is. Our flowers change with each week ever so slightly. And I do think that that also sort of matters to a degree. It's a little bit more authentic. It doesn't have, you don't have to go all in, but I do think that there's that, but also the DIY thing is really interesting in the sense that just for us during wedding flowers, it's an incredible commitment and it's an incredible amount of work. It's really, we are devoting days of preparation to do wedding flowers. And I would say it's very stressful for couples when they think they're going to do it because even the most organized person who gets everything done, it just bottlenecks in your wedding. And you just can't do that because you're both orchestrating the show and you're the star of the show. And you can only do so much. And it's overwhelming having all of your favorite people and all of your person's favorite people descend at the same time. And everyone wants to celebrate you and talk to you. I mean, it's really one of the more unique experiences a person has. And so as much as possible, you don't want to be trying to DIY things that final week because it's really actually going to be stressful. And I see it happen sometimes where they say, you know, we're going to build the arch. And it's like, all right, if you're going to build the arch, build it, but please build your arch and have it done like a month prior or two weeks Mm -hmm. prior. But like, I've had couples, couples who I love and I'm friendly with who are still building it like the day before. And it's like, that was stressful for them. And I know that was stressful for them. So I very much try to tell people, or even someone says like, I'll just send my mother over to pick things up. And I say like, your mother's, I promise you, like she's also going to be feeling overwhelmed. So as much as possible that if ever there's a moment to not be doing DIY, don't do it. If you want to do some stuff in advance that you can plan out, do that, but do not sign yourself up for anything for at least the last two weeks, probably the final month, but at least the last two weeks, because your stress levels as it is, they're still going to be feeling fairly tested. And actually there's two other tiny tips that I have that aren't totally flower related, but as someone that works in the wedding industry, your phone can be very stressful. Almost like your birthday is very stressful these days because it's just going wild all day long and you can hardly relax and you're trying to hike and have lunch. You want to have someone that either you give the number to so that everyone can call that person if they have a question, vendors and friends. And you also want to have maybe someone that literally helps you field your texts as you're getting your hair and your makeup done and important things are still coming through your phone. It will make you feel a lot less stressed to have that. And then the one other thing I would say is there will always be moving parts and weird things that are going to happen on your day. That's just a guarantee. And just try to remember to enjoy the day because sometimes people are very, very stressed. And that makes me sad when I see that because it's your special day and that's all that matters. And so if things are running behind a little bit or something's going on, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. The last month leading up to my wedding was a total shit show because we had to replan the entire wedding two weeks before the wedding. And I was crying every day. I was so stressed out. I was also wrapping all of my content for Bloom and Grow so I could take my honeymoon. And I told myself our wedding was on Saturday. And I said, you have till Wednesday evening. You can cry and stress and you can feel awful and have panic attacks until Wednesday evening. And then on your drive to the Berkshires, when, because we had to drive, we had a three hour drive to the Berkshires and Billy and I took separate cars. So I had my own car. I was like, I'm going to release all of this and I'm leaving my stress in New York and I'm coming to the Berkshires and I'm going to be, I'm going to just let it go. And I'm just going to allow what, what, what will be, will be so much of that was trusting my team because, you know, we had just contracted you to add, you know, the florals for the tent and 
we had just had to get a lighting designer. Like there were just so many things that ended up happening because of this tent switch. And I was just like, whatever. I'm getting married. If I'm getting married in the parking lot, I'm doing it and uh, we'll, we'll release it. Okay. So I'm so excited. So let's talk about my wedding a little bit and the vision that you so beautifully brought to life. So I obviously knew that I wanted to have a planty wedding and I incorporated plants into my wedding in every way possible. There was a separate episode about that, but, um, you know, the flowers was really interesting for me because I'm a plant parent. I have all this tropical foliage, but I also didn't want the florals to be like houseplant themed. Like I didn't want a houseplant themed wedding. I wanted it to kind of lend itself to houseplants and I wanted that to kind of be there, but I also kind of wanted, we got married in a very kind of like woodsy, like I kind of just wanted to be like a forest fairy nymph kind of in my romantic wedding. And so a big vision for me, like the way that made sense and translated for me was having a lot of ferns in the wedding. But you and I kind of came up with some really interesting things. Like I remember I, you know, brought up garlands because I feel like garlands was huge in 2019 and 2020. And I wanted greenery garlands around the table. And then you informed me at how expensive greenery garlands actually were, which I thought they were like the cheap option because there were no flowers in them, but actually it takes a lot. You educated me on the fact that it takes more labor, but you had like such a cool idea to lay. We took palm leaves and monstera leaves and ended up making kind of runners with these leaves and then had the florals on top of them. And it was a cool kind of more affordable way to have a lot of greenery on the table, but also it was a really fun way of tying the houseplant theme in. I feel like that matched you so much that to me, that just makes so much sense. Anyhow, I associate the monstera leaf with you like that just, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and you had, I mean, our sweetheart table was pretty epic. Do you want to talk a little bit about the sweetheart table? Cause I felt like it kind of did have a garland, but it did have monstera leaves. Sweetheart tables are one of the prime things as well. There's the sort of altar and then there's a the sweetheart table. Those are the two, I would say main things that people really like to go hard on and, and fair enough, because that's where there's going to be an epic photograph. And so that has been a big trend a lot. And in England, they don't have a sweetheart table as much in America. They are big into the sweetheart table Mm -hmm. or just the head table that they have in England as well. So, I mean, I think that that's where you want to have a dramatic statement because that's sort of what makes things look the most exciting and dramatic. And, you know, a little bit of drama goes a long way. When else are you going to be sitting there with your favorite person with sort of this flower arrangement specifically for you? I mean, and candles and people are making toasts, but you had, I mean, the, it was really kind of an installation, but there were ferns and monstera leaves. And it was like, the table was kind of exploding in greenery, which looked so beautiful. I don't think we had one flower on our table. I think our table was all greenery. I can't really remember, but it, that's what I remember was just the greenery statement that it was. Well, there's such a statement in the power of greens. And I think that that is something that really is coming more and more into focus is that flowers are lovely and flowers are heavenly, but there's so much of a dramatic effect that can be had with big leaves. And again, that's also, I think a big influence of what's happening in California. California right now is using really big leaves. I'm down in Miami and the flower scene down here also involves a lot more sort of dramatic statements of big sort of palm leaves and palm fronds and different things. And I like that because I feel as though it it just brings in a sort of exciting, dramatic flair to any occasion. And I also like that there was a time where it was really, you can do tropicals or you can do garden flowers, but you can't do both. And at this point, what I think is interesting about flowers is you can do anything you want to do. And it's just whatever you like you know, pampas grass is very in right now. I'm not as into it because I find it blows all over the place a little bits. And so I just don't want people to have that sort of dropping into their food or their hair, but in general, the sort of big leaf look, like, I think that's, a, I mean, I've always been into that when I would do sort of the windows in Rockefeller center, we would use big leaves like that, because again, it really sets the tone and it makes it look sort of, whoa, something really is happening here on our card and gift table and on our memory table as well. Katie, my wedding planner in this, in this last episode talked a lot about how you really do need to fill those tables. And that's something usually an oversight and they made you guys did such a dramatic thing where you just put different tropical leaves in vases actually standing up. And it brought such an interesting layer of height to the table and also was a rather simple 
thing to do for someone who maybe is doing their own flowers or for someone who, you know, just wants like a really simple option for their wedding that isn't more flowers. Um, I thought that was a really fun little statement moment. I think that you're absolutely right about that. And I actually think whether it's flowers or leaves, bud vases are also really having their moment. They have been for a long time. My friend Ashley is Joe Biden's daughter and we did her reception flowers in 2012 and she wanted bud vases and they were so pretty. So bud vases have been happening for a long time, but I find more and more and more people want bud vases. And whether they want it to be flowers or whether they want it to be leaves, which I think is a more up and coming style, that is so effective because it's just little details, but it makes and creates such a statement without a lot of product. Yeah, totally. And there's almost a simplicity to it. So it's almost, you know, sometimes they do neck messes and they have tons of jewelry and and that's a statement itself, but also sometimes just one or two pieces of jewelry actually in certain ways holds just as much effect. So yeah, I think that that actually is going to be something that we'll be seeing a lot more. Here's what I like about bud vases. Cause we also on all of our long tables had bud vases, I think with a mixture of leaves and flowers on each table. My biggest thing for planning the wedding was it's my biggest pet peeve and to each his own. If you like this, no, no judgment, but I don't like sitting at a wedding table and having the flower arrangements block my view of other people sitting at my table. And I feel like bud vases kind of eliminate them because what is a bud vase? Three inches tall. So you have this nice three to six inch installation of little bud vases. They also just like look so cute, like scattered, and you can kind of pull together a whole color scheme with it, but you're able to look over the bud vases and not have a huge freaking bouquet of like long stem roses, just like cutting off the face of whoever you're supposed to be talking to, you know? You are 100% right. And that is one of the common classic things that happens is sometimes a bride will come and say, I've got these vases. I'm really, really into them, but they're just too tall. And the biggest thing is you don't want the flowers to block the view of the other people at the table because it completely cuts the flow of conversation and interaction. And it makes the flowers, rather than being something that's enhancing the situation, they're taking away from the situation to the point that people will move them out of the way, which is I mean, that is one of the classic mistakes that somebody can make, whether it's a florist and that's a real rookie move. So they really should know better or someone who's trying to do DIY. So you're 100% right about that. That's a real thing that you must keep an eye on. It's like a pair of high heels that hurts and you can't walk properly in. There's no point in doing it if it looks good, but doesn't actually look good when you're trying to wear them. Another thing though, that's worth mentioning that's very important is for a bud vase because they're smaller, you want to make sure it's not going to blow over. So if you are having an outdoor ceremony and more and more with COVID, things are becoming an outdoor thing, you want to make sure things are secure because you don't want things knocking over. You don't want things blowing over. And if you are using a big leaf, that's something you need to think about. You want it to be a solid bud vase so it doesn't tip over because not just is it not a good look to have things blowing over, but also it could be potentially dangerous because you don't want sort of glass to roll off the table and break. Yeah, especially if you have lit candles next to them. Yeah, totally. Especially if you have lit candles. So that's a big thing to think about, the wind factor and having things secure and stable. Let's talk about the one thing I had to mention. And, you know, I've talked several times now about transitioning to the tent and how stressful it was. We ended up adding to our contract with you right in the last minute because we just wanted, we just said, please, I'm sure my wedding planner had a bunch of conversations that I didn't know about, but I was like, just fill the tent with greenery, please just make it look nice. And like a not plastic tent. And what you guys ended up doing, I thought was so clever. The tent had six very large tent poles and you wrapped all the tent poles in greenery. And it looked so Cool. When you walked in, it was such a statement because the greenery went all the way up the tent poles or for the most part, all the way up the tent poles. And it just set a very green kind of fancier vibe for the entrance. So can you just talk a little bit how those, the logistics of that works? Yeah. I mean, it involves a tall ladder. It involves multiple people. So that just is a lot easier of a situation to do. It involves wired twine, which is a florist's best friend. It involves prep work beforehand so that you're ready to go with putting the pieces up. So it's not quite so stressful in the moment. Most florists aren't afraid to get up on a tall ladder and do their thing. So you do need to have a fair amount of balance. I was a gymnast when I was younger, and I do think that in a weird way that helps. I'm not afraid to whip up on a ladder and do something. 
And again, it's also quite standard though. Like that's a real move for florist is decorating tents and making them look really glorious and mm-hmm. gorgeous and using the temples and enhancing the temples rather than having the temples just be in the center because they have to hold up the tent. You sort of turn them into these glorious props that create this sort of magical world. So yeah, I mean, I think that yours were at 100%, like that's such a focal point in what you see and what you notice. But that's why flowers and plants are so important. And the power of greens is definitely displayed in your tent, just having that sort of wrap around the column and then something splaying on top. So I'm sorry that it was stressful for you that you had to bring in a tent. <laughs> it was worth, I feel as though in certain ways it almost held the space more. A hundred percent. And also it was such a sign from the universe, but we got to see the tent like two days before we got married. And the tent came with 10 huge potted palm trees. And the tent, the palm trees just live in the tent and no one told me. And so when I got in no there and I told walked, you, no one oh, told me so fascinating. That would have made you feel better if you'd known. Yeah. So I, when we walked in the tent or maybe another wedding had them and left them, I don't really know the story of the palms. All I know is the first time we walked in the tent, we were such a bundle of nerves and the palms were like, okay, it's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Plants are everything, truly everything. I was just reading the world of interiors and they just, the latest cover, it's my favorite sort of design decorating magazine. And apparently the person that was sort of doing the interview and the photography said, we should get in a large potted palm. And so they got a huge one. And in my opinion, and I know I'm biased because I love plants and flowers. That to me is what makes this shot of this person's kitchen, yeah, that or dining room that much more glorious. A hundred percent. Plants are everything. Plants are life. And I have to say, I mean, I am very much, I learned a lot about myself planning a wedding. I feel like I was definitely one of your stereotypical girls who is like, I'm not going to fall into those bridal stereotypes. Like I'm not going to be crazy about flowers or I don't care about my invitations. And, you know, I didn't dream of my wedding growing up. So I just like, I kind of was unattached to a lot of stuff. But then as I started learning about it, I'll say the two things, my invitations and my flowers, I think were my biggest surprise of how much I enjoyed the process of kind of creating the vision and also one of the highlights of the wedding. Like, it, I don't know, I feel like in terms of elevating it, I felt like the invitations really set the tone for the whole wedding experience. And then I feel like the flowers just really were just a beautiful through line. And I'm so thankful for you for, for doing them. Well, it's an honor that such a plant person came to us. I mean, the one thing also I want to say that I love that you did that I wish that everyone did is I love that you gave a plant out to everybody. I think that that is just so sweet and so romantic. And then everyone has a plant that sort of, they got in honor of you. I wish that everyone did that. I think that that is one of the best ways to send somebody with something is by sending them with a cutting or something. And it's just, Mm -hmm. to me, there's such a growth and metaphorical sort of, I don't know, promise unless in the whole thing. So I thought that was a wonderful touch. And again, it's not surprising to me that you enjoyed your flower and plant portion of things because that's who you are. Totally. And it was a huge, huge through line of our wedding. Um, yeah, the Hoya hearts, I will say with some timing stuff that happened, they were a big, big take on the week repotting 150 Hoya hearts. The week of the wedding was a lot for sure. It totally worth it. And also you guys were very game and open to being collaborative of me being like, Hey, by the way, there's going to be 150 Hoya hearts that also have to be spread across the table. In addition to the plants, like, are you guys cool with that? Can you guys figure that out for me? You guys were like, yeah, sure. (laughs) I mean, as a wedding florist, you have to just be able to roll with everything and be flexible. That's, I think one of the biggest things is that almost like a dancer who can just jump in whenever they need to, if the beach changes, you just have to be flexible and keep your spirits up and just roll with whatever happens. I love that. Any other notes on, I'm sure many listeners who are listening in, who are planty planting weddings are probably going to want to go the greenery route the way that I did. Is there anything that we should know about greenery specifically when contracting with a florist and, you know, wanting to incorporate them, wanting to incorporate it into our weddings, anything like different than flowers or. I would say the biggest thing is try to stay open because if you say I like sage greens or I like dark greens, or I, you know, I'm open to lime greens. Once you say what you'd like, then as much as possible, try to be open to a sort of variety within that palette. Because again, like some weeks, the eucalyptus comes in and it's absolutely glorious. There's some weeks where it comes in and it's just not as great as we'd hoped it would be. So we'll go with another sort of dusty looking plant and mix the two together. So I think that as much as you can sort of explain what you'd like, but then be open to a little bit of 
maneuvering within that, that that will allow you to enjoy what's happening and to get the fresh, the most fresh, most gorgeous product of the week. That's what I would totally suggest. And you talked with me about that when we first spoke, because I remember the, me wanting the bouquet, all of ferns, but so many ferns aren't going to stay in a bouquet out of water well. And so you guys kind of threaded the line of there were some ferns, but then there were also some plants that looked a lot like asparagus ferns or looked a lot like other types of ferns that still kind of brought that vibe. But understandably, like you couldn't do a bouquet of maiden hair fern cuttings like that would have been insane. Well, it's such a blow because they're so gorgeous, but that's one of the things about Pinterest is you can see a gorgeous arrangement with gorgeous friends. But the truth is, is that there's a lot of really pretty friends cut them. And within half an hour, they're starting to dry up and panic because they don't have water. Although of course there's certain ways that you can do it by, you know, having them in water or oasis, or there's other ways that you can do it, but in general, or having an artificial one mix in with everything. So you can usually get what you want if you're willing to sort of go about it in different methods and be flexible. Be flexible, I think, is one of the biggest things I would say. Trusting and being trusting and flexible. As a florist and as a bride <laughs> or groom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and actually that brings me to one other thing that I would really recommend for everybody, which is as much as possible, try to approach the whole situation with love and really just get along with everyone that you're working with. I think that that makes a huge difference. So we like to have a picture of our couples so that we know who we're making the flowers for because not everyone will have met them. Yeah. And I just think things like that, keep it personal and, and friendly. I love that. Well, I want to wrap up. Well, we have to wrap up. We're way over time, but I want to ask, so do you have a favorite flower right now or a favorite flower combination right now for a bouquet that is the Kare- just what Karina enjoys right now? I've been very into anemones. I got really into anemones this summer in the Hamptons. That was one of my main things. I just think I just had more access to them than I normally do. I really like spring flowers. So I really like hyacinth. I like lily of the valley, but that's very sort of specialized. I like flowers that have a fragrance. So I think freesia just smells so delicious that I just sort of like mixing in a little bit of freesia into things because it just spices things up a little bit. I like sort of spring bulbs. I don't like yellow daffodils, but I like the daffodils that have sort of white outside and the peach center. I like lilac. I mean, I think I like a bit of seasonal, but then spring's my favorite season. So it would be. But I, again, for me, the variety of everything is what I like. And I like tasteful flowers. And I have to admit, I don't like cheap flowers. Like to me, a cheap flower brings down the arrangement. And that's a big thing in my team that everybody knows. What would be a cheap flower? Like a carnation? Carnations are interesting because um, some people who do have sort of very good taste are partial to carnations. And I feel that it's almost a little bit sort of subversive for them to say. And, And in certain cultures, carnations are considered a really nice flower. But just, you know, there's just certain flowers that just aren't as, they're more called filler flowers. So, you know, daisies and things and pom-poms and things that you would get from sort of supermarkets. I just, to me, it degrades the brand a little bit. There's a new wave of florists that are incorporating them that make it look good. I just don't like to see a really good looking arrangement with really tasteful flowers with a cheap flower mixed in. To me, money wasn't saved on that situation whatsoever. The whole brand was degraded by that. I think if you use tasteful ingredients, then it's almost a guarantee that the flowers are going to look tasteful, much like cooking. If you use good ingredients, then you'll have a good product. So that's what I would say. But I think greens can help it be not so expensive while keeping it looking very tasteful. Totally. And I have to say a new flower that I learned about from you guys that I was really on the fence about, but I was like, they keep suggesting it. So I'm going to let Jesus take the wheel and just roll with it was the blushing bride protea. Because I don't love a protea. I don't love the big protea that like you see in every like boho wedding thing. I didn't love that. But then when I realized this protea is a much more miniature and it's, it's called the blushing bride, but it's the most beautiful colors. It's like white and pink and blush. And at your suggestion, I, uh, that was heavily incorporated into our wedding. And I think maybe because it was a seasonal or it was just like a veil. I think it does create a seasonal look in a, in a nice, you didn't see it coming kind of way. I'm with you. There really is something glorious about it. And there's something strangely bridal about it. So I love that. That's the, that's the title. Even yeah, even if the title of it was, but, um, that was a, a flower that I am newly introduced to. And now when I see it, I will always buy it to remember that Billy's Boutonniere had one too. 
but this was amazing. So where do you cover, where do you do weddings? If people wanted to hire you and work with you? I mean, we've done hundreds in Massachusetts. I was doing them out in the Hamptons this summer. I am setting up a sort of satellite operation in Miami for the winter. A lot of the crowd that I worked with in the Hamptons, there's a sort of cycle between Florida and the Hamptons, which has been a sort of nice crossover. So yeah, I would say the two places that we are offering weddings is we are firmly established in Massachusetts. The shop has been there for 10 years. We're second best in the Valley. We're known on the scene there and we have a great team. And then here in Miami, definitely there'll be weddings being offered in events. And so, I mean, those are the two main places and then the Hamptons in the summer. And we do travel to other places as well. Like I've done weddings on site in England and in France and you know, done in Delaware, like there's, you know, we'll travel if it's a big enough wedding, we're up for it. But those are the main places. And where can people find you to see more of the beautiful, beautiful weddings and events that you've done? There's the botanist.easthampton and that's our Massachusetts site and the shop site. And then the botanist, just as it is, and botanist has an E at the end, that sort of is the one that I make sure that I keep up to date with sort of things that I was up to in the Hamptons in the summer. And that will have... Miami content. So it'll probably be a little bit more tropical. This is on Instagram? Yes. Okay, cool. Sorry. Yeah. I just assume it's on Instagram. Yes. It's on Instagram. I thought it was the botanist for a while. So it's botanist with an E at the end. Yes. And that's only because that was my nickname back (laughs) in the day. So I still say botanist. Lots of people will refer to us as the botanist, which is completely fair since there is an E at the end. But yes, that's us. And then also we have the website. So we have the Botanist Florida, we have the Botanist Hamptons, and then we just have the botanist.com, which is our Massachusetts site. So amazing. You can find us. Yes. And we'll link to everything in the show notes. Thank you so much for being along my journey for two years. We appreciate you. And thanks for lending your time. This is going to be a lengthy episode, but we covered a lot. And uh, thank you for, this is kind of a houseplant adjacent wet, you know, wedding episode, never been done before on Bloom and Grow. So, so thankful to have you here. Well, it's been heaven speaking to you. Thank you for having me. Okay, plant friends, that was a doozy. I know it was a little bit longer of an episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I just couldn't stop talking to Karina. There's so much to learn, especially I feel like we're tropical plant people. We're all about the foliage. And there's just so much to learn about the cut flower industry from the cut flower growers to how florists source them to how florists keep them in such beautiful shape. And then also the art of designing a bouquet or a wedding arbor or a flower arrangement. I mean, man, there's a language to flowers. That's a wonderful book if you haven't if you haven't read it already. But flowers are such a beautiful means of self-expression. And there's so much interesting history around that. And they're a pretty magical thing. And Karina's kind of a pretty magical person. So if you're in her area, definitely use her. <laughs> we loved her. Our wedding looked amazing. And speaking of how amazing our wedding looked, you should definitely head over to my Instagram. I've been posting all month about the various planty aspects of our wedding. Definitely go check out the video that Karina made for us that I'm hosting on the Bloom and Grow YouTube channel if you want to see how she walks us through how she arranges a bridal bouquet, which was really interesting to watch. And also, if you've got anyone, you know, getting married or planning a big party in their future, please send them this series of episodes. We would love to use this Planty Wedding series as a way to kind of spread the word about Bloom and Grow Radio. And along those lines, if you haven't already, go ahead and leave us a review on your favorite podcast player. I'd be so thankful to you. So, plant friends, we wrap up the Planty Wedding series and we wrap up the year. I, man, I need to spend some time reflecting on... <laughs> The crazy year that 2021 was and all of the amazing content that we put out and the amazing guests that we've had, it's on my to-do list (laughs) to get a little reflective. I'm excited to spend some time in the Garden Society. I'm a married lady now, which is kind of crazy. I'm so thankful to have gotten to share this series with you and to share this year with you and be a part of your journey. Never hesitate to reach out to me via DM or email to let me know what you'd like to see in 2022 of Bloom & Grow Radio. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show. So thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content, 
or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Planned Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your Plant Parent Personality Profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality, and you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at bloomandgrowradio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month, and these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes, usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing. plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... 
That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 